name is Rebecca Cook. I'm a counselor with the CVUSD Breakthrough Student Assistance Program, and I'm so excited to welcome you all here to our first parent guardian workshop of the school year hosted by the Breakthrough Student Assistance Program and the Caneo Schools Foundation. Um, I'm going to have Luciani, our translator, share some information about accessing translation for those who need it really quickly. Buenas tardes a todos. Soy Luciani Garbín y estoy en esta presentación como intérprete para que puedan tener acceso al servicio de interpretación al español. Tienen que buscar, hay un icono como de un mundo, de un globo del mundial, un abajo del todo, al lado de donde dice share screen. Entonces ahí hagan clic en ese icono del mundo y elijan español. Entonces ahora en cuanto yo me despida de ustedes, voy a activar la opción de intérprete y podrán entrar. Funciona nada más en una computadora normal o en el teléfono, pero no si tienen una Chromebook de prestada del distrito, no les va a funcionar eh, este servicio de interpretación. Buenas noches a todos. Thank you, Luciani. Um, each year, Breakthrough and the Caneo Schools Foundation provide a series of workshops for parents and guardians on relevant topics that provide tools and strategies for supporting your children. Um, tonight, we have Jennifer Mundy with us, and she oversees the new wellness centers at our high schools, and she will be presenting strategies and tips for students to have a successful return to school this Wednesday. Um, this webinar will be recorded and will be posted on our Kennehill USD YouTube channel. Um, we will also share a copy of the PowerPoint slides with everyone um, after, you know, sometime later this week. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please submit them in the Q&A. Um, and if time permits, uh, Brenda Rachels, the other breakthrough counselor, will facilitate a Q&A at the end of the presentation. And we will do our best to get to as many questions as possible. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Jennifer Mundy. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here with all of you. Um, I'm sorry, I guess, that we can't be in person like we used to be, but this is going to be as good as it gets for now. Um, I am Jennifer Mundy, and I am a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I oversee the wellness centers that will be in every high school in the Conejo, which is very exciting. Um, we also have wellness services that will be offered at the middle schools. So keep your eye out. You'll be hearing more about these things. If you went on a tour of a high school, you may have had the opportunity to see one of our wellness rooms, but um, it's very exciting what Conejo is doing and how they're putting mental health as a focus um, in this unprecedented time, if you haven't heard unprecedented a million times over the last year. So today we are talking about how to help our kids return to school later this week. And I'm going to share my screen with you all. Let's see if it works. Okay. Becca, can you give me a thumbs up that that looks okay? Does, that look, does it look normal? We're good? Okay. So we're going to talk about some strategies to help our students return to school. Um, this is an ever-changing landscape. So if you are looking for um, the most recent information, it may actually not be in this presentation when you watch it recorded because things may have changed by then. So please refer to the CDC um, or California's uh, COVID19.ca.gov. And for the latest and greatest information regarding what's happening in our district, you can go to CVUS, uh, sorry, ConejoUSD.org um, slash CVUSD forward. Or if you just go to our website, you'll see it right on the front page, just to keep you up to date. So here's what we're hoping to cover today in our presentation. We're going to talk a little bit about what this pandemic has done um, to all of us and to our students. We're going to um, end our time together by learning about some of the mental health warning signs 
And most of the time, we're going to be talking about 10 tips that you can use to support your students in returning to school at this, at this time. So let's talk briefly about the pandemic and um, some of the stressors. So we've all been impacted by this pandemic, obviously. And in the mental health field, we've seen an increase in kids who have had mental health issues and symptoms. Um, it's really not a surprise, actually, because in 2013, some research was done on kids who had been quarantined because they had been exposed to uh, a contagious illness, um, not a pandemic, but a contagious illness. And the children that were quarantined scored four times higher on an assessment that measures post-traumatic stress than children who were not quarantined. Um, criteria for PTSD was met in 30% of isolated or quarantined children based on the parent's report and 25% of quarantined or isolated parents based on self-report. So we know that we are in a heck of a time here. Um, some of us have experienced um, uncertainty, loss of resources, our natural ability to cope has been challenged. Um, all of us have experienced grief, whether that's grief of a loved one that we've lost uh, or loss of connection or, or even loss of um, some of the rituals and milestones. You may have lost a loved one or had a celebration, a wedding or a birth of a child in your family, and you're not able to celebrate those um, rituals and milestones in the way that you would like. This graphic here talks a little bit about stress, and we're going to talk about three types of stress. The first type is um, positive stress, and this is moderate, it's short lived. It, in general, gives our, um, our stress hormones a mild boost, gets us moving, but then our body and our brain are able to work, solve the problem, whatever it may be, and then kind of return back to normal uh, relatively quickly. Tolerable stress is uh, more intense than that. The stress response system is activated for a longer time. But when you have supportive caregivers, when you have parents, teachers, other adults in, in the child's life um, that serve as a protective factor, it tends to buffer or sort of um, ease the, the child back or the adult back for that matter. And um, it takes a little bit longer to recover from tolerable stress, but we do recover. Toxic stress is a more stressful event. Um, it is a more chronic uh, stress response. It's prolonged. And when this goes on for a really extended period of time, this can disrupt the development of um, brain structure and other organ systems. Um, so some of our students have uh, experienced toxic stress during this pandemic. So we're gonna move along um, to talk about 10 strategies to support students in returning to school. So a lot of us got to have the experience of being the teacher over this last 16 months. And we may have developed a whole new respect for this profession. Um, as we learned, it was not very easy to do. So you may be thrilled that remote learning is over, that your child is returning to school. I know my husband today, as he cleaned up another mess and put more dishes away, thought, wow, I just cannot wait for kids to go back to school. So you might be extremely enthusiastic that your kid is about to return to school, but your student may not share that same enthusiasm. So our first strategy is to expect the unexpected, which I think we're all getting pretty good at at this point. So as we are returning to school, we have to remember that all of us are out of practice. We haven't been in social situations. Um, I spoke with a principal the other day and he was saying, 
the second graders that are coming back, the last time they were on campus, they were beginning kindergartners. Like there's this giant gap of time that went past. And for some students, it's not gonna be, they're not gonna have missed a beat. And for other students, it might be a little bit challenging for them to return. Students who are normally very social might be feeling a little bit of social anxiety and they may find this transition really difficult. So what can you do as the parent or caregiver to um, help you to expect the unexpected? Uh, we need to be flexible. We need to practice patience and we need to remind ourselves that this is temporary. This transition to school, to returning to school is, um, it is the stress of it is temporary. Uh, I anticipate we might see two different scenarios. I don't know, this is my first pandemic, so I, I'm not sure exactly what we'll expect. But I think one thing that we'll see is kids being very anxious about returning to school. And I think the other thing that we might see is kids being really excited about returning to school. And then the honeymoon period is gonna be over and we're gonna see kids go, eh, I'm not really sure that I, how I feel about doing this anymore. So as parents, ways that you can protect yourself as you are getting ready to um, expect the unexpected is to remember to do mindful things like taking three deep breaths, um, ground yourself when you're feeling anxious by doing something really simple like feeling your feet on the floor. When you have time, Google how to have a mindful cup of tea or um, a mindful piece of chocolate and just get that experience of um, grounding and calming down as we go through this, this time. So strategy number two is it's okay that it's not okay. Um, giving our kids blanket reassurance, reassurance statements like it's fine, everything's okay, you don't have to worry, there's nothing to be worried about is really kind of invalidating. And what it actually does is make kids feel even more uncertain, like, oh, I'm, I think somebody's actually lying to me or I'm not sure that things are okay at all because I feel so scared about things and this my parent or my caregiver or whoever it is is telling me like no everything's great don't even worry about it there's nothing to worry about makes kids even more anxious and can make them seek reassurance even more so instead of creating this sort of false reality what we can do is validate what's actually happening for our students we can validate the feelings that they're experiencing we can name the emotion if we know it, and we can remind them of how they can handle it. Things that they maybe have done in the past where they've demonstrated the ability to handle things that are difficult or challenging. So I have some statements here um, to kind of get, give you an idea of what I mean, and then you'll have to make these statements fit your own student. Um, so, uh, going back to school feels overwhelming. This is a big change. What are you most worried about and what are you most excited about? Sometimes as parents, we tend to focus on just the worries and we don't focus on, you know, what are you excited about? Are you excited about seeing your friends? Are you excited about playing um, volleyball? Are you excited about trying out for the school play? What are you excited about? Um, another thing that we could say is you're feeling worried that you won't have any friends when we return to school and that must feel pretty lonely. So we're actually just naming what the experience is. Let me know if you want to talk about strategies to meet new people. And the reason that I say this, um, let me know if you want to talk about strategies to meet new people is because when we speak and if you have a tween or a teenager, I know you know what I'm talking about. If you tell a kid how to do something, they immediately reject it. If you invite them like, hey, when you're ready, you wanna learn something, you wanna talk about something, that gives the kid the opportunity to say, well, yeah, what do you mean? How, how would I make new friends? What are you talking about? And they'll be more open to it. So sometimes giving them that option is a helpful trick there. And then uh, another thing that you might be able to say is something to the effect of transitioning to remote learning was really hard. Remember when we couldn't figure out how to use Canvas? It took a while, but we figured it out. Transitions are hard, but I have faith that you can do it. 
So if you think back to a time when things were difficult, and for most of us, it wasn't that long ago that something was difficult, um, you can help your child remember that they remember when you didn't think you could do that, and then you did, that will help them be able to transition um, into thinking that they can handle this situation too. And then what you can do is avoid giving the, those promises like I talked about, focus on safety, focus on all the ways that um, the school is working to keep the children safe. For example, if a, if a student is worried about like, it's dangerous because everyone's wearing masks, we can reframe that and say, no, it's actually really, really safe. It's the uh, masks are a way to keep us safe. So we wanna focus on safety rather than danger. Provide brief reassurance. So if you have to reassure your child every hour that it's gonna be okay, that's a sign that some kind of intervention may need, may be helpful to you. Um, and so that might be a sign to reach out and get some help from somebody else. So if you're able to reassure somebody in, I think the number is 20 seconds, then the reassurance worked. It shouldn't take much longer than that. And then of course we need to be ready to shift gears because things are changing all the time. My son went to Dodger Stadium today, yesterday, no masks were required, today they are. So things are shifting all the time and we have to sort of have that ability to adjust. Tip number three is keep it real. Um, information is not scary to children. Not having information is scary. So we want to make sure that our kids have all the information that they need in an appropriate way. And there's a reason for this. Humans are storytellers. We always tell ourselves a story 100% of the time, whether we are aware that we're telling ourselves a story or whether we are doing it unconsciously. If you do not provide your child with the full story, the full picture, they will create the story. And usually the story that children create is um, more dramatic, more scary uh, than the actual story. So having the right information can help reduce anxiety in this uncertain time. And I know it's hard to figure out exactly, well, how do I know what the right information is? I am a huge fan of something called reflective practice. And reflective practice is this thing that we do where before we take action, we take a moment and we kind of ask ourselves some questions to determine what is the right action to take and why am I taking that action? So it doesn't have to be anything long and, or drawn out, but just to take a moment, you could even write um, some of your thoughts down to get a real clear idea in your head and then have the conversation with your child about whatever may be happening. So some questions to, that you can use to um, ask yourself or to reflect with a partner or another group of parents um, to help you decide what is the information that I'm going to share with my child that feels like it's the appropriate information for their age, their developmental level. And so here are a list of questions and um, you'll be getting the slides so you don't have to memorize anything right now. But um, so what am I hoping will happen by sharing this information? What are you hoping will happen by sharing the information with your child? What are my child's specific worries and concerns? What if school will be different and what will be the same? What does drop off and pick up look like? When are masks required and not required? What are expectations of social distancing? How will homework or classwork be assigned and collected? And does my child seem reassured when they receive the information? So having these questions and sort of allowing yourself some time to process and think how you're gonna share information will help the information that you share be meaningful um, and reassuring to your child. So again, providing age appropriate information um, about what's happening or what's changing because we are gonna be having these conversations probably several times as things uh, change throughout the school year. If you don't have the answer, it's okay. 
Um, let your child know that you'll find out. You can just say, that is a great question, or I wish I knew the answer to that, but I don't. I'm going to have to go and find out the answer. You don't have to have the answer right away. And then ask your student what their questions are, what they're curious about, or maybe what they've heard about. It will help give you some information about what is going on in their school that they're maybe overhearing other students talking about, and they may have some um, questions or concerns about. So number four is um, the only thing to avoid is avoidance itself. We're always going to help our students take tiny steps forward. So avoiding anxiety feels fantastic in the moment. It is great, but it hinders us in the long term. So when we avoid things, our anxiety, that our anxiety wants us to believe that we can't handle, you, it's too scary, it's too dangerous, you shouldn't be doing that. What actually happens is we make our anxiety bigger. So we wanna support our student in taking um, steps forward, even if the step is minuscule. And I'll show you what I mean. So this student here um, has some anxiety and the anxiety is represented by this tiny monster that's sort of hanging out by his head there, giving him some really bogus information. So the anxiety monster is saying things like, everyone's gonna laugh at you. What if your teacher's mean? You won't know where to go. No one's gonna like you. What if you catch COVID? You will throw up in front of class. I don't know, so it must be terrible. And so when we have these thoughts, naturally we feel horrible. And so then the student says like, I don't really feel good. I think I should stay home. And as parents, we might let the students stay home because they're not feeling well. And then anxiety um, says, see, I was right. You're only safe at home. And the, the child feels better and the anxiety gets bigger. So we want to try to avoid avoidance. We wanna support our kids in moving forward, even if it's in tiny steps. We'll talk more about this. So what we can do as parents is provide op opportunities for our kids to have small, gradual exposure to what makes them anxious. Um, don't do it for your student, um, be there to support them, but have them do it on their own, um, whether that's uh, finding their class, opening their locker, um, putting their lunch box in the special place where lunch boxes go in their classroom, wh whatever it is, don't do it for the student, but be there as a support and an encourager as your, as your child is doing that. And then put your attention on the tiny step that they took even if it is so tiny and it feels extremely frustrating that your kid isn't doing the thing that you really want them to do. Don't focus on the big goal of like, oh my gosh, why are you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? Focus on the tiny thing that they were able to do. So our next tip is encourage and acknowledge students for being courageous. There is some, this is a very busy slide. Um, but it has, has a lot of information I wanted to make sure that you got. Um, there's some great information uh, on TED Talks and uh, just on the internet in general on something that's called growth mindset. And so what we wanna do as parents um, to support and encourage our kids is to, especially when our kids are struggling with something and, and we feel like they're not doing anything right, um, we want to be a detective for the positive. So um, if your student successfully went to and from school, but they forgot their homework or they left their lunchbox, let it go and focus on the fact that they went successfully to and from school. Keep your focus where it matters most right now, which is getting our kids back in school. Remember in the first slide when there was that parent jumping up so excited to go back to school? You are no longer the teacher. Yay, remember that? You don't have to be the teacher. So let the teacher be the teacher and you be the parent. So your job is the parenting part and let the teacher do the teaching part. If your student comes home and has negative things to say, um, maybe they were really frustrated, try to find the strength in what they're talking about and don't buy into their negative experience totally. Don't invalidate it, but don't buy into it. So the reason this slide is so busy is because I have this example. 
So the student might say, so many things went wrong today. I forgot my homework. I spilled my drink on my shirt. I was late to third period. My locker wouldn't unlock. And I had to get someone from the office to help me. It was the most horrible day ever. And I might want to say as a parent, like, are you kidding me? Get over it or something to that effect, which is not terribly effective. What you can say is something more like, oh my gosh, that's horrible. I can't believe so many things went wrong in one day. That hardly seems fair. Well, I admire how you handled each difficulty in your day. You are a great problem solver. It isn't, it isn't easy to keep going with so much difficulty, but you did it. If you can handle today, you can do just about anything. Um, so really focusing on the fact that although the kid is complaining about all the things, they did it. So we wanna focus on what they actually did. And I have provided a list here for you of um, grit inspired strength-based sorts of words that are um, character traits that we may want to um, emphasize when we're talking to our students. So tip number six is rebuild students' sense of competency. One thing that happened over the pandemic for many students was they had a difficult time figuring out how to manage learning um, online. Some kids, it was easy peasy for them, no problem. But for other kids, they really struggled. Um, they couldn't figure out Canvas or they would forget to log on or they didn't want their cameras on or whatever. Whatever happened, their sense of competency as a student may have taken a hit. So um, if your kid is rattled from that, what we can do is um, remember that returning to that classroom might take some adjustment, might be hard for them initially to get focused or to get organized. Again, let the teacher be the teacher. Um, be patient with yourself as the parent, be patient with your student, and remember that it takes time to readjust. And um, we need to focus on the social emotional first and the academic work second. If we can get that social emotional piece solid, the academics are gonna fall right in place. So number seven is teach them the power of their thoughts. So we often feel that our feelings cause our thoughts, um, but there is evidence and there is a whole school of thinking, <laughs> of funny that it's school of thought, um, around how our thoughts are often causing our feelings. So when we feel like our feelings just sort of sneak up on us, we don't really have any control over them. Like the feeling just like pops in our head or the feeling just comes over us and then we're devastated or we're anxious or we're whatever the feeling is. We don't really have any control over it if it's just like this monster that's sneaking up behind us and like, wow, there it is. So if we can teach our kids that uh, about thoughts, it will help them to master sort of how they're thinking about things. So um, there is, it's sort of like a bumper sticker, don't believe everything you think. But my favorite quote is positive thinking, much like negative thinking, gets easier with practice. So we are hardwired to be negative. It is in our DNA. There is a very good reason for us to be negative. And that is because back in the when time was new and there were, you know, um, we were hunters and gatherers or there was dinosaurs or whatever was happening, we needed to pay attention to safety. We needed to remember what was dangerous and what was like the fact that berries tasted good didn't really matter. It wasn't going to make a difference. Like, yay, they taste good. That's nice. But let that go but remember that that snake is dangerous. Remember that that insect is dangerous. Remember that whatever, the pterodactyl is dangerous. So our brains are like Velcro for negative experience. It's like, it sticks to us because we wanna make sure it doesn't happen again. But we are like Teflon, like a nonstick pan. 
um, and the positive experience just slides right off. So if we can help kids understand that the reason that negative things stick is there's a survival reason, but we can shift that. It just takes practice. Um, that will help them. So this triangle right here is the cognitive behavioral triangle. And at the top of the triangle is thoughts. This idea is that our thoughts are connected to the next point in the triangle, which is our feelings or body sensations, which are connected to our behaviors or actions, which then go back up to the top of the triangle and influence our thoughts. Um, so here's an example of um, how this triangle may work. So if somebody has a thought that spiders are scary, terrible, and frightening, they are trying to get me. What feelings would come from that? The feelings that come from thinking that this little spider is coming to get you is scared. You may have a racing heart. You might feel jumpy. You might feel anxious. You might feel nervous, fearful, icky. Any number of things may happen, which might cause you to jump on the table and scream. If we work with somebody who has that fear on changing their thought to spiders are tiny and most are harmless, they are more afraid of me than I am of them, then we might feel more calm, in control, competent, and brave, which might cause us to do something like ignore the spider or squash the spider. So our thoughts influence some of our feelings and how we react. In this more realistic um, cognitive triangle, there is a student who is thinking to themselves, everyone is going to think I'm weird, no one is going to like me, which will make them feel nervous, self-conscious, paranoid, sad, lonely, upset, which will make them do things like look down, maybe not smile, avoid others because somebody might think they're weird, um, not talk to people, not participate. When you have that demeanor, you might have people react to you by not talking to you or not asking you, not inviting you, not participating with you, which will reinforce your thought of everyone thinks I'm weird and doesn't want to hang out with me, which makes you feel nervous, self-conscious, paranoid, sad, lonely, upset, and then causes you to further withdraw. So if we work with a student on the thought and we say, maybe this is how the thought would change. Everyone's a little nervous, just like me. I am likable and I have a lot to offer. So nothing like crazy, just very simple. The person may experience, oops, sorry, may experience, um, they're nervous, but they're not alone. They're self-conscious, but they're self-assured. They're somewhat courageous. They're feeling a little like, okay, I'm going to take a risk. And they're breathing. They're not like holding their breath. And when they do that, it gives them the opportunity to do something like smile, look at other people, send those non-verbals that are friendly, that say, I'm open. If you said, do you want to have lunch? I might say yes, which might cause that person to then reinforce that thought of, I am likable and I have a lot to offer which would make them feel more accepted, less nervous, et cetera. So number eight is make it visual. This is different if you're working with a preschooler versus a high schooler, but it is the same all the way across the board. Anytime that we can make our expectations, routines, rules, schedules, explicit and visual, our students will have more success. So for little kids, a visual routine or a visual schedule is amazing. You can hang something by the front door that says, don't forget your water bottle, your snack, your backpack, your calculator, whatever you need. If you have an older student, you can help them um, by having a family calendar that has um, whatever's going on. If you have rules or guidelines in your family, make sure that they're explicit, make sure they're really simple and um, that you have an understanding from, from everybody about that. So whenever you can make something visual, that is helpful. Okay, number nine. Now we're getting into the mental health piece. Um, getting support. So we don't grow out of mental health, um, we grow into it. 
So this very brief um, slide here has some things that you may want to consider that are signs of having a mental health issue that you may want to consider seeking help. So if your students or you actually as the parent even are withdrawing from social activities or you're appearing down for more than two weeks, so not two months, not two years, two weeks, that would be a time to seek support. Um, any kind of self-harming, uh, any threats, any sort of risk-taking behavior, out of control type of behavior, sudden overwhelming fear for no reason or fear that you feel like isn't um, isn't an appropriate level of fear, not eating or using any kind of um, throwing up or laxatives, um, excessive focus on body image, mood swings, drug and alcohol use, any kind of drastic changes in their behavior, their sleep, their eating, personality. And then if they're having an extremely difficult time concentrating or staying still. Um, we have to take this with a grain of salt, I think is the saying, because next week the kids might have difficulty concentrating or sitting still. It doesn't mean that they have a mental health issue. It means they're transitioning. Um, but if there, there was difficulty um, concentrating and there were some mood swings or and something had been going on, going on for two weeks, it's a good idea to um, consider seeking help. So here are some places you can find um, mental health help. You can ask your physician, you can ask a friend for a referral. You can look on Psychology Today or call your insurance provider and see who they cover. You can always ask your child's teacher, the counselor at school, or um, somebody else at the school that you feel like you have a good relationship with. And then once you have a provider or a short list of providers that you're considering. Um, this is a list of questions that you can consider asking. You don't have to ask all of them, but the ones that felt important to you, um, usually a, a um, clinician will give you like you know 15 minutes or 20 minutes to sort of talk and figure out if you're the um, right client for them, if they're the right clinician for you to sort of figure it out. And in that 15 or 20 minute time, here are some questions that you could ask to sort of figure out, is this the right clinician for my family or for my student? Okay. You need as the parent to know your stuff. This is, we're still on tip number nine, but it's a big tip. Um, know your stuff. So this list right here is a list of local and national hotlines and websites to assist you uh, and your student with mental health needs. So it's a great idea to familiar, familiarize yourself with mental health resources and websites. Um, place your resources uh, in a place that's easy, easy to reference, like your refrigerator or your bulletin board. I'm going to talk more about that in a second. Put the crisis numbers or any of these numbers in your phone. Save it as a contact in your phone. Talk to your child about um, signs and symptoms of mental illness, as well as resources available to them. And then the last thing is that you can help your student um, identify who their trusted adults are so that they can, they can get help if they ever need it. So the refrigerator thing. When we all had babies and they were so little, what was on our refrigerator? We had a list of emergency numbers. We had maybe like the police, we had poison control, we had um, all kinds of emergency phone numbers because it mattered. If something, if your child ingested something scary or dangerous, you were contacting poison control right now. And so what is the message we send when we put emergency phone numbers on our refrigerator or on our bulletin bar or, or by our phone? We send a message that our lives are important. And if we're ever in an emergency, which could happen, this is where you go for help. So we need to expand that from just poison control and 911 to the crisis line and to um, other supportive services that could help us if we are in a mental health crisis, because mental health crisis happens to 
all of us. It isn't just those people over there or the parents that didn't do a good job. Mental health issues happen to all of us. So talk to your student about what to look for um, and where to go for help. Uh, NAMI, N-A-M-I, the National um, Alliance on Mental Illness, I believe is the acronym, has a ton of resources for you. And they're, they're linked in, the, in one of these past slides. Uh, they have information for kids and adults. Um, but what we want to do is we want to make sure that our kids understand what to look for um, as far as a sign that mental health is a um, somebody's at risk and that we don't have to say like, if you ever have these symptoms, but we can talk about if your friend is ever down for two weeks, that might be a sign that they need some mental health support. And we want to make sure that your student has people to go to other than you, because although you may be the best parent in the whole world, when your student is in crisis, they may be afraid to come to you. And so they need to know that they can go to whoever is the appropriate person, school counselor, um, their teacher, the principal, um, uh, family, friends, whoever it is that is a, a safe identified person. And then on the very bottom of this page, I have linked this fantastic website, which I will show you here. So if you go to Conejo USD, dot org and you'll see on the front page there is this red button that you see there that says social emotional support and mental health resources if you click on that um, it will pull up that whole list of crisis phone numbers as well as other information um, so just by telling your kid that information they already have access to a bunch of resources and then from there, if you scroll down a little bit, you will find the CVUSD Virtual Wellness Room. This is the coolest web page. It has all of these things that I've listed down here at the bottom. It has inspirational videos, it has sounds, music, it has online coloring, it has exercise videos, it has information about nutrition. Um, I was talking before about doing mindfulness, and if that's a new or strange idea for you, there's mindfulness um, videos and information, there's games, puzzles, um, there's, you can tour a place you've never been, there's animal cams, you could see what animals are doing in various places, there's calming apps, there's a million things and it's all right there. Um, so just by sharing that information with your kids, it helps them um, know where to go if they're struggling. So that whole thing, that was tip number nine. That was a big one. So number 10, what works? Help your student identify what works. So what helps them calm down? What makes them feel better? Um, what can they do when they're feeling low? What can they do when they're feeling anxious? Have them brainstorm or write down all the things that they think might help them. And then you put it in a list. Oops. Um, you're going to put it in some form of a list because when we're stressed, we don't have a lot of access to thinking like, well, what's going to make me feel better? But if you have a list or you have a plan, you have something that you can do. So this might be something really simple like drinking water. Um, it might be um, doing some sort of grounding exercise or stretching. Um, anything rhythmic is really great for us, whether that's drumming, jumping rope, um, knitting, stretching, all of these things. These are all fantastic ideas and your, your students are gonna have many, many more ideas. So whatever it is that will help them, have them write it down so it's sort of like a plan um, that they can, they can access. And this is where we come to the end. So just to remind you, um, I'm Jennifer Mundy, and um, you'll be seeing me in your school, your high school's wellness centers. Super excited that they're opening very soon. And if you have questions, you can email me at this website. I will do my absolute best to get back to you or to connect you to the people that you need to be connected to. Um, I guess I will stop sharing. And I think, I don't know if anybody has any questions, but go for it. Thank you.
you, Jennifer, for sharing this important information, especially getting ready to go back to school. Um, we have the Q&A open, so if you have any questions, please feel free to put those in. Um, we are going to be at one of the first questions that came in is the presentation slide. They are going to be emailed out to all of our attendees tonight. So you can be expecting that in the email that you signed up for. Um, any other questions, put them in the Q&A and we'll get through them. Um, I do have one for you, Jennifer. Um, you talk about avoid avoidance. And for a child or a teenager that is just absolutely against returning to school, they're feeling a lot of anxiety. Um, it's such a struggle even as a parent because it feels so counterintuitive to you know, what we wanna do to protect ourselves. So you did talk about providing small opportunities of, of exposure or, or provide opportunities for small exposure, I should say. So can you give us some ideas of what that might look like for like a, a primary grade versus a secondary grade for a student that is just really struggling with wanting to go back on campus? So if you have a student, regardless of their age, that's really struggling, it's a great idea to reach out to your school in advance and let them know and see what plans the school may have to support you to support students in general. Um, the idea of the small step to avoid avoidance is if your kid is freaking out about going back to class, don't go to class, go to school. If you can get them in the door and in the office and they sit in the office and this may not work at every school. And if we have 400 kids that want to do this, we're going to have to rethink it. Um, but typically it gets boring in the office and eventually kids, that's what happens. The anxiety goes down because it's boring. Yeah. And then, okay, fine, I'll go to class. Or something happens that allows them to um, join back in and feel safe doing so. So if we push a kid too hard, then they freak out. And if we don't push a kid at all, we allow that anxiety to grow so big that they won't go to school at all. Um, so whenever there's school refusal, I try to get the parent to get the kid to school. Don't worry about class or if it's like, I, I, you know, I have math class and I'm freaking out about math class. Don't go to math class, go to the office or whatever the school determines. And then let's see how we get that going. But when we avoid the thing altogether, we just make our anxiety grow so high. So like you said, start small, just get on the campus. So, okay. Um, one of the parents is asking, do you have any tips for making new friends? So a lot of students haven't been on campus and are feeling a little unsure of their ability to make friends or socialize or connect. So any tools or skills, tips that you would give parents tonight for both younger and older students? Mm -hmm. um, this is going to be a big issue for students. Um, being on Zoom for so long was really hard. If you're uh, in a younger um, grade, and uh, I, I'm picturing like drop, when you drop the children off at school and they're sort of on the playground together, or they have like an activity they can do together, helping your child sort of engage with other children um, will, will help foster those relationships and friendships. Um, as kids get older, um, my high schooler would prefer that I not come onto the campus and help him make friends. <laughs> so if you have an older child, um, sometimes we can challenge our kids to do one thing. And so that might be like, I challenge you to say hi to three people in the hallway. And I challenge you to make eye contact um, with kids during first period or I, something that's a, a small but um, a small challenge, but might create either a sense of like, well, I didn't die. I smiled at somebody and I didn't kill me or could create like, oh my God, the person smiled back at me. Um, another thing to do is to flip it the opposite. So instead of like, um, I got, um, I socialized with 10 people today, have your student try to find, try to get rejected five times. Um, because in order to get rejected five times, they would have had to have reached out a lot of times. And usually you've reached out enough times that something sticks. Thank you. And um, how about 
kindergartners. So any tips specifically for the little ones, especially ones who maybe didn't get the preschool experience and this is all new for them? So even when kids have a preschool experience, shifting to kindergarten is new. Kindergarten is really, um, I mean, if, it's, if we're doing it correctly, kindergarten is different than preschool. It's not supposed to be the same. So when preschoolers move to kindergarten or when children who didn't go to preschool move to kindergarten, it's new. Um, those visual reminders or those visual cues can really help children understand what's coming next and make things less scary. There is, um, and they're already available on the internet, you wouldn't even have to make them, but there are social stories that you could print out or you could make yourself. So if you were to walk to your, you know, walk on your child's campus and take a picture of the playground and the classroom and the where you hang your coat and where you put your lunchbox and where you um, use the restroom and where the office is and all, whatever they need to know. And you put a book together that says, this is what happens in the day that helps kids feel a little more safe. They, they know what to expect. Um, and I would say every kindergarten teacher will tell you that on the first day kids cry and then they stop. They, it doesn't, it doesn't go on when mom and dad leaves, the kids stops crying. Um, even though it breaks our hearts and then they um, go on and in the weeks to come, they go to school and it's not an issue anymore. If it is an issue ongoing, then probably ask the teacher, um, what, what do I do? <laughs> yeah, yeah, get some additional support. Okay, yeah. um, I'm so glad that you brought up negative thinking because um, I know as a parent as well, like often we can model those very behaviors that we are trying to avoid in our own children. So if we have the negative thoughts that lead to the negative feelings and behaviors and we're voicing that, um, that's something that we need to be aware of too during this time. Because you were saying, you know, for our own students, helping them realize that they're doing that, but we also need to start with kind of our own thoughts and behaviors, true? So um, yes, we have to watch our own negative thinking, but for parents, we have a different kind of negative thinking. Um, and this, uh, Dan Siegel, if, if you don't know who I'm talking about, he has a book called The Whole Brain Child. Um, he has a lot of books um, and they're in all kinds, all different languages. But he talks about something called uh, shark music. And we as parents have something called shark music. So when, if you were at the beach, if you were in the tropics and you could imagine yourself walking into the ocean and the warm, wonderful ocean and the feel the sand in your toes and um, listen to the birds singing or the, um, what the waves, you would feel so relaxed and so comfortable and so amazing. So if you keep that picture in your head, but now the, the sound of the birds and the sound of the waves, the relaxing sound is replaced by the Jaws theme song, um, that na 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 that one, you no longer feel relaxed. You're in the water and you're about to die and terrible things are gonna happen and I have to get out of the water and this is, so you're not in the moment anymore. You're in life or death. And so as parents, we look at our kid and they're doing something like not turning in their homework. And in our mind, we have shark music and now they are uh, our uncle Jimmy who lives in the basement and he's 50 years old and he's, doesn't have a job. And, and so we've gone like way, way far away from my kid for to turn in their homework. So we need to pay attention to negative thinking, but we need to pay attention to our shark music, which is what is it that you're so afraid of is going to happen if your kid doesn't fill in the blank, turn in their homework, take the AP class, whatever it is, whatever, whatever thing, we all have it. None of us gets away without shark music. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, Jennifer. Um, one last kind of question, comment, just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Um, the one thing that you had said, the first part of the presentation was to validate instead of blanket statements. Because for, for anyone that has anxiety, that is a very real and scary feeling. And the last thing you wanna do is invalidate that because it's now, it's not important. Um, we've kind of made it something that we've minimized how they felt pretty much. Um, but I did like how you put that on there where you 
are validating the statement, but then you've added something positive, like a positive statement on the end. Um, transitions are hard, but I have faith you can do it. Now, those are going to be very important statements as we go into this next week. Would you, would you say that's correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, whatever feeling your kid has, even if it doesn't make any sense to you, is just the feeling that they have. So we just accept it as it is, even if we don't agree with it or think it's the right way to feel. So we just accept it where, at whatever it is as that they are. And then we can add um, more information after that. So if they're like freaking out and feeling anxious, they're so scared, they are afraid of not having friends, it is so, so what we don't want to say is we don't want to agree with them. We don't want to jump in their boat where they're, or jump out of our boat or whatever, jump in the water and drown with them. We don't want to say like, yes, it's so scary. The, you have no friends and it's going to be terrible out there. It's probably going to be the worst day ever. We don't want to do that. But we also don't want to say like, are you kidding me? This is ridiculous. Get over it and move on. We don't want to do that. So somewhere in the middle is this place where we can say, yes, you are feeling scared, lonely. Whatever it is, whatever the feeling is, that's your feeling. Mm -hmm. You have that feeling. And I would feel that way too if I thought I had no friends. But I'm remembering when you were in Girl Scouts and you didn't have friends, you and then fill in the blank with whatever they did. So see if you can find that, like be the detective, find that thing that they did, that moment where they were brave and help them remember that Um because it does take time. They're not gonna show up to school on um, Wednesday and, and be the prom queen. It's gonna take some time to build those relationships and, um, and, and hone those skills. So parents can already be thinking ahead of times of um, times that they remember their kids having success or overcoming difficult situations and doing really well. Um, Jennifer, thank you for sharing your knowledge and tips tonight. I know this is um, a hard subject for a lot of families, especially um, coming off the last year. Um, I just want to remind our families that in addition to the social emotional supports that Jennifer shared tonight, that we also have the CUSD's Breakthrough Student Assistance Program. Um, the Breakthrough Program is free for all CUSD students K through 12. Um, students that need additional social emotional support or struggling with substance use are welcome to participate. Uh, there is a referral form on the district website that parents can complete that will connect you to a counselor. Um, also, this presentation is going to be uploaded onto the Caneo USD YouTube channel. It's also going to be on the Breakthrough website. Um, like we had mentioned a little while ago, every participant is gonna get a copy of, of Jennifer's slideshow so that you have some notes that you can refer back to over the next week. Um, we also want to thank all of our parents attending tonight's event brought to you by the Caneo Schools Foundation and the Breakthrough Student Assistance Program. Um, we look forward to seeing you at upcoming events and we wish all of you a fantastic year and a good night and um, again thank you for coming. Good night. <laughs>